Hello and welcome to Insight of Thalmology. This is Dr. Amrit and today we are starting a very important series on diabetic retinopathy. So without any delay, let's get started. In the first video of the series, we are discussing what, when and how of diabetic retinopathy. That means we are discussing the etiopathogenesis. So what is diabetic retinopathy? Diabetic retinopathy, also abbreviated as DR, is a vascular complication of diabetes. Basically, there is a dysfunction of the retinal blood vessels due to the chronic hyperglycemia. It is usually said and it is proved by various studies that after having 20 years of diabetes, 99% of the patients who have type 1 diabetes mellitus will develop diabetic retinopathy and 60% of those with type 2 diabetic mellitus will develop diabetic retinopathy. So as you can see from this statistics, diabetic retinopathy is more common in type 1 diabetes mellitus which is associated with the decreased level of insulin in the body because of a defect in the production of insulin by the beta cells of the pancreas. So what are the risk factors for developing the diabetic retinopathy? Diabetic retinopathy and its development depends upon the duration of diabetes. That means how long are you suffering from diabetes? The control of diabetes, how, uh, how good is the control of sugar levels, pregnancy, hypertension, nephropathy that is kidney diseases and various other problems like hyperlipidemia, smoking, cataract surgery, obesity and anemia. Control of blood sugar levels is very important and it is shown that about 10% decrease in the hemoglobin A1c which is a marker of control of uh, the hyperglycemia and diabetes can actually lead to about 40% decrease in the risk of diabetes mellitus, uh, sorry the diabetic retinopathy. So just a 10% decrease in the HbA1c can show an improvement of about 40% reduction in the risk. What about hypertension? Controlling of blood pressure is very important, especially when we talk about the type 2 diabetes mellitus. Here, a control of hypertension can actually bring down the complication of microvascular uh, retinopathy or microvascular complications of diabetes mellitus to about 37%, so quite a significant figure. So let us see what exactly happens inside the vessels in diabetic retinopathy. For that, you have to go back to, uh, to your basics of biochemistry. In a normal individual who is not suffering from diabetes mellitus or a patient with diabetes who has good control over the sugars, what happens to the glucose is that the glucose basically enters the glycolysis uh, mechanism and then enters the Krebs cycle and through these uh, two mechanisms it is finally converted into uh, water and carbon dioxide and on the way it will give us the powerhouse of the cell that is the ATP which is the energy which supplies the energy for various biochemical reactions in the body. Whatever excess glucose is remaining that is stored as glycogen in the body and a part of glucose uh, as glucose 6-phosphate is also uh, shunted to the uh, pentose phosphate pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway basically is a powerhouse which will give us the NADPH and along with that it also makes a lot of ribose uh, sugars. This ribose and NADPH are very important for the production of various ribonucleotides which are important for the formation of DNA and RNA. The NADPH are also called the reducing molecules. So what is meant by this reducing molecule? Whenever uh, we have any oxidative stress, that is the stress or the damage which can occur because of the free radicals in the body, that is taken care of by this NADPH which is having a hydroxyl, uh, hydrogen moiety which is represented as H+. This hydrogen can actually combine with this oxygen and convert it into water. And as you all know that water is harmless to our body compared to the nascent oxygen which is the free radical. So therefore this pentose, uh, pentose phosphate pathway is very important and uh, also the NADPH which is very important. However, what happens in diabetes uh, and moreover chronic hyperglycemia which is not very well controlled is that the glucose will now enter a toxic 
pathway and that pathway is called the polyol pathway. In this polyol pathway, the glucose is actually converted using the enzyme aldose reductase into sorbitol. The sorbitol is then converted into fructose using the sorbitol dehydrogenase. Now the second step of this cycle that is the sorbitol dehydrogenase can actually get overwhelmed very soon and then we are left with the sorbitol in our system and what happens is that the sorbitol keeps on accumulating, specifically it accumulates in the eye within the lens. Sorbitol is toxic in the sense that it acts as an osmotic agent and it actually uh, absorbs water and can lead to cataracts also. Now what happens uh, with sorbitol pathway or with polyol pathway is that not just this osmotic uh, uh, agent gets accumulated which is a cause of osmotic stress which dehydrates the cell along with that the NADPH which is the reducing power of the body which takes care of the oxidative damage occurring in the body is also used up so you can see in this arrow that the aldose reductase is actually using this NADPH and its H moiety and the NADPH is converted into NADP so that is the reason this polyol pathway is a toxic pathway which is occurring in diabetes mellitus so let us summarize that in this flow chart so whenever we have a persistent hypoglycemia there will be a polyol pathway activation because of the polyol pathway activation the sorbitol levels will go up and as the sorbitol level goes up the osmotic stress will increase and now as i told you previously the nadh and nadp uh, plus will go down and the reducing potential of the eyeball uh, or the body in general will go down and there will be oxidative stress moreover this nadh is also very important for the nitric oxide synthesis which is actually a vasodilator vasodilator means something which will increase the diameter of your blood vessels and cause more blood to flow through it so whenever the nitric oxide synthesis goes down the vascular impairment in the form of vasoconstriction will occur and less amount of blood will flow through the blood vessels the same thing can be explained by the fourth uh, arrow of this flow chart that the NADH, NAD plus, so basically the redox imbalance means the oxidative stress and the ability to deal with the oxidative stress that is totally imbalanced in diabetics and because of that we have reactive oxygen species increasing and oxidative stress occurring in the body. And when we have the fructose and fructose can actually cause glycation. Over here, I would like to tell you what is meant by glycation. So, whenever the sugar molecule is added uh, to a protein molecule or to lipids, that is called glycation. And such molecules actually are toxic. They themselves trigger uh, various kinds of leukocytes. And what I mean to say is that they trigger inflammation and they can again act as source of oxidative damage and inflammatory damage to the cells. So, this glycation can actually ha happen with the endothelial cells and basement membranes brain okay and therefore they can they are a cause of damage in diabetic retinopathy so basically we have lots of inflammation going on we have oxidative stress going on in diabetes and because of that oxidative stress and inflammation various kinds of cytokines and chemokines will be released released and if you remember from your pathology whenever the cytokines and chemokines are actually coming into the picture a lot of wbc's or the leukocytes are going to come into the picture and since all of this is happening in the blood vessel all these blood cells are going to come within the blood vessels and they will uh, form a clump over there and they will get collected and they will stop over that place and therefore this process is called leukostasis okay so stasis of the wbc's because of this inflammation oxidation stress and these wbc's themselves again will induce more inflammation and this cascade just keeps on going on so in diabetes we basically have hyperglycemia and that hyperglycemia can be actually damaged more uh, by the presence of coexisting hypertension or dyslipidemia and because of that various biochemical and molecular abnormalities are taking place as I told you the polyol pathway, the advanced gly uh, glycation end products, the protein kinase C, the hexo hexosamine pathway which is nothing but the pentose phosphate pathway. Because of that there is hypoxia as I told you there is occlusion of the vessel there is contraction because the nitric oxide synthesis is going down there is reactive oxygen species developing because the reducing potential of the eyeball is going down and then there is lots of inflammation so all of that 
uh, junk and all of that inflammation and damage is finally bringing us to what exactly happens what are the various problems which are uh, happening within a eye which is suffering from diabetic retinopathy so we have something called pericyte loss we have basement membrane thinning uh, thickening then we have the capillary occlusion and then we have the vascular shunting because of the occlusion we have ischemia and in response of the ischemia we have neovascularization and we as we all know that the neovascularization vessels will bleed so one more thing that you can add over here is that you can have bleeding in the form of vitreous hemorrhage you can have bleeding in the form of preretinal hemorrhage or interretinal hemorrhages and so on and so forth so let us have a look at uh, all of them one by one So the first thing in the pathology of diabetic retinopathy that occurs morphologically is the loss of pericytes. So if you see pericytes are actually cells which are uh, in a present surrounding the endothelial cells in the blood vessels. So this is the endothelial cells and the endothelial cells are actually uh, sitting on the basement membrane and two or more uh, endothelial cells can be actually uncovered by these pericytes from the outer side. So this abnormal pericytic deposition of material due to sorbitol and the advanced glycation in products that I told you through the aldoseductase pathway, they can get deposited over here and all that glycation is toxic and therefore this uh, pericytes will finally uh, die and because of that we will have loss of pericytes. So pericytes are also forming a structural framework for the blood vessel and as they are lost, the, structure, uh, the structural integrity of the blood vessel will also be lost. Next, what we have is the thickening of the basement membrane. The normal basement membrane is about 0.5 microns. And what happens in diabetic mellitus is because of the deposition of the glyc uh, glycation products that I told you in the pericytes also, there will be thickening of the basement membrane. Now, because of the thickening of the basement membrane, what happens is the lumen of the cap capillary or the vessel is decreasing and because of which we will have reduced blood flow and that will lead to hypoxia. Also, with thickening of the basement membrane, we will have impairment of the diffusion and transfer of nutrients and metabolites across the blood vessel. So, all of this is finally leading to hypoxia and decreased nutrients to an already compromised retina. The third damage which occurs after pericyte and basement membrane is to the endothelium. As you can see in this picture, this is a normal endothelium and these are the hypertrophied endothelium which are actually getting hypertrophy in response to the damage to their counterparts. And because of that, even the tight junctions which are existing between the two endothelium which form the tight, uh, which form the inner blood retinal barrier, that is also broken down. So what is meant by Virchow's triad? If you would remember it from your pathology classes, Virchow's triad will actually explain you why does a thrombus form within a blood vessel. So a thrombus will form whenever there's an endothelial injury plus a hypercoagulability plus when there's a stasis of the blood flow. Now, if you would remember and if you would think for a while, all these three things are happening in diabetic retinopathy. So we have damage to the endothelial cells because of the glycation end products. We have hypercoagulability because there are lots of WBCs which are coming and along with that platelets are also coming in response to the various chemokines and cytokines which are coming. And then we also have stasis of the blood flow because of the thickening of the basement membrane. So all of these can actually lead to a formation of thrombus also within a patient who is suffering with diabetic retinopathy. And that will lead to occlusion and that will finally cause the ischemia. And what is meant by ischemia? Ischemia is nothing but it is decreased blood supply to a particular organ. So what happens when there's occlusion and when there's ischemia? So whenever a focal area will lose its perfusion, the overlying retina will uh, suffer with the acute ischemic changes. So these changes will actually come as uh, a cotton wool spot formation. Now at this juncture, I would like to tell you that there's a video on cotton wool spot available on the channel. So I would like uh, all of you to go and visit that video. 
Along with the presence of cotton wool spot, there can be other microvascular dilatation or shunt formation which can happen in the areas of capillary obliteration. And these shunts which you can see over here in this diagram are called the intraretinal microvascular abnormality. They are called the IRMAs. They are very important and it's very important to differentiate them from the neovascularization uh, present over the disc or elsewhere. So that's a subject or topic for another video. And what I want you to remember is that the IRMAs are formed in an area where there is ischemia and they're basically shunt vessel connecting the two vessels in an area where there's already decreased blood supply. And in this picture, you can see the presence of cotton wool spot, which is also an indicator of ischemia in diabetic retinopathy. Now, what are the ab abnormalities you can see in the blood vessel? Now, as I told you that the parasites will be lost and the parasites are forming the structural framework of the blood vessel because of which the vessel will now not be able to maintain its normal shape and will actually be thrown into this uh, bead-like structures and this beading will occur and this is called venous beading which is uh, quite commonly seen in diabetic retinopathy. Along with that, sometimes uh, this beading might get exaggerated and there might be a vascular outpouching from a blood vessel and that is called microaneurysm. Since they are very small, they are called microaneurysm. So the mechanism of formation of microaneurysm is nothing but the parasite loss which is causing local weakening and that local weakening is causing the outpouching of the blood vessel leading to formation of the microaneurysm. As you can see in this picture, this is, the, this is how the healthy retinal capillary network should look like and this is how uh, it looks like in diabetic retinopathy. You can see there is an area where there is no capillaries and this is called capillary non-perfusion area because the capillaries over there have either got occluded or they have formed microaneurysm and therefore there is ischemia. Ultimately, whenever there is ischemia in the eye, there will be certain factors which will be released and these out of these the most important one is the vascular endothelial growth factor and in that vascular endothelial growth factor also it is the wedge of a which is very important mm. along with that there are platelet derived growth factors hepatocyte growth factor which are released and they are going to cause uh, formation of new blood vessels and these new blood vessels are called new vascularization this new vascularization as you can see the stuff of vessels which are growing over the disc if it is present on the disc it is called new vessels on the disc nvd d stands for disc and if it is present somewhere else apart from the disc it is called new vessels elsewhere nve so an important point about nvd or nve is that they are not mature vessels they are immature vessels they can leak very easily and they can also bleed very easily and therefore they can also uh, cause uh, many times hemorrhages into the eye and whenever there is new vascularization the diabetes is now diabetic retinopathy is now called as the proliferative diabetic retinopathy now a word about the blood retinal barrier now we know basically there are two main types of blood retinal barrier, the inner blood retinal barrier and the outer blood retinal barrier. The outer layer of retina, as I told you in my video on the layers of retina, is the retinal pigment epithelium. The retinal pigment epithelium cells have very tight junctions between them, which will not allow the toxins and the other inflammatory cells to actually enter into the retina and they will form the outer blood retinal barrier. The inner blood retinal barrier is actually formed by the tight junctions on the endothelial cells itself. So the endothelial cells have connections uh, within themselves which are uh, very tight and these are called tight junctions because of which the anything traveling in the blood also does not find way into the retina. Okay, so this is the blood retinal barrier. However, as we know what is happening in diabetic retinopathy, endothelial cell is getting damaged, the junctions are getting broken down, the pericytes are getting lost, blood uh, basement membrane is getting thick and the loss of WBC which are coming and causing a havoc in the retina they are all leading to alteration of the blood retinal barrier or breakdown of the blood retinal barrier and finally when the blood retinal barrier breaks the vascular permeability will increase and when the vascular permeability increase all the proteins are going to come out and you can see this exudation and this will finally lead to edema in the eye and the most common place is within the macula and because it's happening in diabetes it is called the diabetic macular edema so that's all about the etiopathogenesis and pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy i hope by the end of this video if you stayed with me you would now be able to answer the what when and how of diabetic retinopathy thank you and have a nice day